Welcome to the Prophecy Club. We're going to continue talking about Revelation today. As you know, I have been talking about me memorizing the book of Revelation, and as I've also explained to you, I've now finished that. I'm now going back and getting it down a little deeper, moving it from level three to level four to level five, where I really, really have it. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm continuing to get Revelations. I plan to make a DVD called Revelations on Revelation, but we're not taking any pre-orders until I actually make the DVD. However, and I'm still getting a lot of really good revelations, but I don't want to get into all of those revelations, but I do think it is important for you to understand as much about revelation before you get the DVD, because I'm sure once you understand really what's in that DVD, when I explain it, everybody's going to have to have it. <laughs> I mean, I think it's going to be one of the most important works of my 24 years of being in the ministry. So hopefully you would believe me and get that DVD. But in the meantime, I think it's important that everybody understand the basics of Revelation, the things that I'm not going to be talking about. At least right now, I do not think I'm going to have time to go through teaching all the way through Revelation verse by verse all again. So, I mean, the Revelations is not going to be teaching Revelation verse by verse. It's just going to be on the Revelations. So let me explain to you what I'm about to do. I'm going to take the next several broadcasts and I'm going to play a large portion of the DVD, Revelation verse by verse, basically giving you a lot of information because it's important for you to understand that information so that you can understand the Revelations on Revelation DVD when that comes out. Because, I mean, if I say, well, let me tell you who the two witnesses are. And I start going into that, and if you aren't familiar with the scriptures already, it's going to be, well, you're going to be playing catch-up, okay? So here's what I'm going to do. The next several broadcasts, I'm going to be playing the audio of the DVD from my DVD, Revelation verse by verse. I think it's very important that, of course, you listen to the broadcast, but even more important that you get the DVD. So we are making probably the best offer on that particular DVD set that we have ever offered. I'm looking up at some of the past offers. We have, uh, first of all, it's eight hours, four DVDs, valued at $120, and in the past we've offered it for a gift of $75. We're going to offer it for an amazing offer today, for, for this particular week. First of all, the topics. What is the message of the seven churches? Who are the four horsemen? Is Revelation layered or sequential, when it goes through the seals and the trumpets and the vials, is it 1 through 21, or is it like a three-layered cake where 111 plays about the same time as 222? I answer that. Who are the beasts from the sea, the earth, and the pit? What does is fallen, is fallen mean? What does it look like the day Jesus returns? How long is the day of the Lord? Is that a year, a month, one evening, one morning? What is that? Who is the woman who rides the beast? Who's the false prophet? Does the new Jerusalem come down at the end of 6,000 years or at the end of 7,000 years? When do we get our mansions? Are there one or two judgments upon America? When is the door shut to the five virgins? Does everyone who survives Armageddon get a glorified body? Two-thirds of mankind is killed in the tribulation. What happens to the other one-third? Again, eight hours, four DVDs. Normally, well, it's valued $120 in the past. We've offered it for a gift of 75 But today, this particular week, we're going to be offering it for a gift of just $30. $30, Revelation verse by verse, and Revelation verse by verse. And you can go to prophecyclub.com and order it. Or you can call us, 785-266-1112. Now, let's go on over to me going through Revelation verse by verse in the DVD. Gather together. And the Bible says in Job that Lucifer also came. And God says, Lucifer, where have you been? He said, I've been walking to and fro and up and down on the earth. Those are rulership. Those are ownership words. But at this point, when John eats the little book, he's destroying their title deed to the earth. Then the angel says, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. In other words, there's time no longer. At this point, we move into the millennium. 
This is when the books are open. Many that are asleep, awake to everlasting life, some to everlasting shame. Then if you look at the bottom right corner, it says it's the seventh file. It says it is done. It says Babylon is given his wrath. And every island flees away and the mountains are not found. All of those are the very last things right near the very last day when Jesus returns. Okay, one of the things I'm going to show you towards the end of this is that Michael Boldea had a very important dream given him by the angel that visits him. And essentially he says you can divide, and we're going to go into the dream, but I'm just going to throw it here just briefly. You can divide Revelation into three categories. A third of the people die from water, a third of the people die from fire, and a third of the people come through Revelation or the tribulation saved. That lines up. Well, why else do you think that it plays from top to bottom? First seal, first trumpet, first vial play on or about the same time. All right, if you look at the first trumpet, you see hail, fire, and a third of the trees are burned. All green grass is burned up, Revelation 8, 7. Then if you look right below it, in the first vial, this is when a noisome and grievous sores come upon men with the mark of the beast, which have worshipped the image. Well, why does the noise of grievous sores come? Because uh, there's hail, fire, and blood of the third of the trees are burned up. Then if you look at the second trumpet, it's also talking about more burning. But it's also saying that a third of the things in the sea, uh, the sea became blood. A third of the ships are destroyed. A third or a fourth of the sea creatures die. That's the second trumpet. But if you look below, you see the second vial. The sea became as the blood of a dead man. Every living soul in the sea died. So we are seeing there's a fire judgment that has to do with the first and second vial. Excuse me, the first trumpet, first vial. Then there's a water judgment that has to do with the second trumpet, the second vial. Then if you look at the third trumpet, the star of wormwood falls and poisons a third of the rivers and the fountains. Many die right below that. The third vial, the rivers and the mountains became blood. So it's again, it's a water judgment. So for these various reasons, I believe that it plays top to bottom. Now, the revelation basically goes through and describes it on different levels, one through seven, and then the one through seven for the trumpets, and then finally one through seven for the vials. Now, this overlays with Daniel. Daniel gives the one half of the puzzle in Revelation gives the other half of the puzzle. If you want to understand the tribulation, if you want to understand what's coming, you have to know Revelation as well as Daniel. You have to have both sides of the puzzle. Now, so let's take a quick look at the chart I've made of Daniel Made Easy. The event that starts the tribulation is when the Antichrist confirms the covenant with many for one week. That one week is one Shabu. That's one seven-year period. Somebody called the other day and said... Uh, is there a verse that actually says that the tribulation is seven years rather than three and a half years? And I said, yes, and I gave him the verse. Well, the event that starts it, that word, word for week is Shabuah. Now, if I say, uh, go get me a couple of uh, golf balls, you come back with two. If I say, go get me a dozen eggs, you come back with 12. Well, if I say, go get me a Shabuah, you come back with seven. So it says, confirms the covenant with many, I believe that's nations, for one Shabuah, one seven-week period. Then across the top, I have first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, sixth, seventh. And then there's the 70th week of Daniel, a seven-year period of 2,520 days. The first three and a half years, which is also time, times, and the dividing of time. Another way the Bible says it is 1,260 days or 42 months. This is Antichrist's rise to power I was talking about earlier. If you want to know uh, part of that, what the Antichrist does, it's listed right there. Then in the middle of the tribulation is when the Antichrist commits the abomination of desolation. What he wants to do, according to Isaiah 14, 12, I believe it is, he wants to sit upon the mount of the congregation. He wants to sit on the sides of the north. He wants to walk in and sit on the Ark of the Covenant. Now, contrary to what you see on some of the Internet places, the Ark of the Covenant doesn't have these funky-looking birds. It's a throne. It's a chair. It's a golden-covered chair 
with an angel facing this way, facing God, an angel this way, and then the Shekinah glory is in the center. So it's a chair. What the Antichrist wants to do is walk in and sit on the Ark of the Covenant and say, I am God. At that point, he said, since I'm not, I am God, you can stop that animal sacrifice over there. And then he sets up an image, an image to the beast. And that image looks like him. And then they turn on the image making factories all across the nation. And they start making idols every place. And that's the reason many of the scriptures say that God judges them because of the idols. So in the middle of the anti or in the middle of the tribulation, that's also when he requires the mark of the beast. Now, this is a big point. I don't believe that the Antichrist requires the mark of the beast at the beginning of the tribulation. I think it is introduced there. Now, we were just talking the other day. The Obamacare is about to come out. And I understand that one of the things in Obamacare is that all people that want to get medical care inside the United States will have to take a chip. Of course, when that comes out and they start requiring people to have a chip in order to get medical care, many of the Christians are going to stand up and they're going to say, Mark of the Beast, Mark of the Beast, Mark of the Beast. No, I understand. A chip is not the Mark of the Beast. You will know the Mark of the Beast by this. The only way you get the Mark of the Beast is you'll have to get down, just like Daniel said, when Nebuchadnezzar had the dream of the image, and then he came up with another idea to make that image. The first thing he did was set up that image. He called all of the chief, you know, the congressmen, the Shirley McLean's. He called all of the top people together. And he says, when you hear the sound of the corner, the sat back, sultry, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image. If you don't, then we'll throw you into the, the burning, fiery furnace. In other words, what the Antichrist wants is Worship. What does God want? He wants our worship. What does God want? He wants our heart. So what does the Antichrist want? He wants our heart. And so you'll know the, the mark of the beast, whatever it might look like, whatever form, however you will know it, when they say you have to fall down and give the knee to get it. Not necessarily a chip. Now we're going to talk about that too. I'm going to show you what I personally suspect strongly is the mark of the beast. Now, let's continue with Daniel Made Easy with the chart. Then if you look at the top, it says there's 1260 days for the second half of the tribulation, the seven-year tribulation. And there's more there. I'm not going to go through all of it. Time, times, dividing of time. You'll see 2300 days the sanctuary is cleansed. That's when uh, Jesus has returned and has cleansed the sanctuary. However, there's, there's 1260 days to the second half of the tribulation. But the point I want to make here is a lot of people misunderstand. And they say, oh, oh, well, no one can know the day or the hour. We don't have to know any of that prophecy stuff. You can't know the day or the hour. And, you know, it's like a sacrilege. If you try to say the name, the, the day or the hour, well, wait a minute. Uh, did Jesus say we can't know the day or the hour? I believe that Daniel is actually warning us when Jesus is going to return. You see, if we knew when the the covenant was confirmed, then 2,520 days later, boom, Jesus returns. Okay, and then when we see the Antichrist going to sit on the Ark of the Covenant, proclaim himself God, then 1,260 days later, boom, Jesus returns. Well, then Stan, how can you say we can't know the day or the hour? Here's why. Because on the day Jesus returns, nobody knows the day or the hour. Because by the time Jesus returns, the earth has turned upside down. The sun is out, black as sackcloth of hair, the Bible says. The moon won't give its light. The stars of heaven fall, and with, uh, like a fig tree casting forth its untimely figs. The uh, stars fall from heaven as, as uh, the, the stars withdraw their shining. And Every mountain has fallen. Every mountain or valley has raised. There's no more sea. I mean, the whole earth is in turmoil. There's a great giant, giant earthquake in Jerusalem. It killed 7,000 people alone. So if the earth is turned, up, turned upside down and the sun is out, all reckoning of time has been destroyed. I don't think that the Father didn't want us to know certain things for a reason. But I do think we can know the year Jesus will return. You show me the, the confirmation of the covenant, covenant and I'll tell you the approximate year Jesus is going to return. I think we can know the year. 
I think we can know the month. We might even get close to knowing the week. But we're probably not going to know the day or the hour because I don't care if we have an electric clock. I don't care if we have a mechanical clock or an atomic clock. When the earth is turned upside down and the sun is out, what day is it? We don't know. See, so that's why we don't know the day or the hour. Now, if you look at the bottom right corner, it says time of Jacob's trouble. The last three and a half years is the time of Jacob's trouble. Then 1,335 days later, we're blessed. And why are we blessed? Well, I think I can show you that. We're going to move on. Now let's go to the fifth seal. Revelation 6, 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for their testimony, which they held. Wait a minute, wait a minute. thought we were raptured out of here. Well, you know, let me speak briefly about the rapture. I've got two DVDs. I've made one called uh, Rapture. Um, the truth about the rapture. And then I made another one, more truth about the rapture. The first one, I go through like 357 different verses, show you everything really more than you wanted to know about the rapture. But it will totally answer your question about how the rapture works. And then the second one, I go through and use more of like the parable of the tares and the, uh, the sowing of wheat and things like that to explain to you about the parable. But there's a misunderstanding in the first century, the first century church had a misunderstanding. They were expecting the Messiah to return like a lion. But he came as a lamb. He came as a sacrificial lamb to lay his blood down so that people could be saved. But you see, one of the reasons that Judah, Judas betrayed him is he thought if he betrayed him, then Jesus would have to say, okay, I am the Christ. Because you remember, they turned to him and said, well, Jesus, will you now return the kingdom uh, to Israel? In other words, they thought that the Messiah was going to return like this great conquering king, overthrow the Roman rule and make Israel this great nation again. They misunderstood. The first time he wasn't coming like a lion, he was coming like a lamb. And the church today has a misunderstanding. They're expecting Jesus to return in the clouds as a lamb to save them. Woe to those that desire the day of the Lord is not a day of light, but darkness and clouds and thick darkness and gloominess. In other words, Jesus is not returning to save anybody. He's returning to burn up his enemies. He will brandish with his sword, with the breath of his nostrils, he will blow that glory down on the earth and he will burn up all of his enemies. And how long does it take for the glory to gl go around the earth? How long does it take for his glory to cover the earth like waters cover the sea? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. And that's what we're talking about. So when it says, when I opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Oh, no, no. You mean I might have to die for Jesus? No. Maybe what we need to be saying, Lord, you died for me. Here am I. I'm willing to die for you. After all, we get the highest crown. I believe if he selected us to die for him, he'll take care of us. So, yeah, there are some that are slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice. Now, look at this. This is important. Saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell upon the earth? And here, this is so interesting. And white robes were given to them every one of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little season until, look at this, look at this, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed, as they were, should be fulfilled. Wait a minute, Stan, you mean the Bible is saying that from the very foundations of the earth, some were selected to give their life for Christ? Uh, well, that's what the Bible says. In other words, I don't think we Christians ought to be looking for an escape. We don't need to be looking to leave the battlefield. We don't need to be looking to be a deserter. We need to be looking to get into the fight. We need to be looking to be salt and light. We need to be looking to pick up the sword of the Lord, the, the word of God, and go to fight. 
Now let's look at the sixth seal. We're in Revelation 6. Revelation 6, 12, And I beheld, and when he opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the moon became black as sack, or excuse me, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. What can make the sun go black as sackcloth of hair? I believe the sun literally goes out. If you look at Ezekiel 30, verse 26, it says the sun gets seven times hotter. Hotter than the sun. So I believe that the sun literally knows it. It's like when you walk in and you flip on a light switch and all of a sudden it's like a flash bulb going off. It gets really bright, boom, and then it's out. I think that's what happens to the sun. The sun gets really, really bright, seven times hotter, and then boom, it goes out. And when the sun goes out, then of course, since the moon gets its light from the sun, the moon goes black. Revelation 6, 13. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. How can you make the stars, now think about this. How can you make the stars of heaven fall unto the earth, even as a fig tree casting her untimely figs? Okay, now here stands theory on this. I think that there is another mystery planet out there. I've done a whole 30 minute TV program on this. It makes sense to me. What if there's another planet that has like a 3,600 year orbit and the last time it orbited by the earth was what caused the flood? So this big planet way out there with this elliptical orbit, let's say it's way out in deep dark space and let's say it's a black planet. It's not on fire or anything. And what if it had a greater magnetic pull like a giant magnet and it's heading toward the earth. That would start to make some of the the orbits of the planets begin to change. And did you know that there are astronomers that are reporting that some of our planets have been making orbital changes? And then as it gets closer, it begins to cause many changes in earth from this giant magnet heading this direction. And as it gets closer, it begins to make the earth that is say normally like this begin to turn a little bit more like this. And then what if all of a sudden the earth were to turn upside down? Isaiah 24 verses 1 and 19 said the earth turneth upside down and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. That makes sense. What other changes might we see? Well, we might see earthquakes increasing. Are we seeing earthquakes increase? Yes. We might see dormant volcanoes beginning to wake up. If you have been following your news, the news doesn't like reporting much on it. It's kind of like they like to say, pass the potatoes, please. But yeah, there was another volcano over here, volcano over there. Yeah, we can't fly airplanes uh, all over the uh, European seaboard because of this volcano up here. There's been all kinds of volcanoes. What makes sense to me is that there is a planet out there. And as it's getting closer, that change in the gravitational pull is already changing us. Now, what if the tribulation were 10 years away or 20 or 30 years away? There might be a planet out there already getting close enough to make changes on the earth. Verse 14. Let me back up Read verse 13 again. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of the places. Now, brothers and sisters, this has to do with the day Jesus returns. I talked about, okay? Every island. Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, verse 3, says every high place will fall, every low place will raise, the crooked places will be made straight, the rough places will be made smooth. In other words, the whole earth turns into a nice, round, smooth ball. There's no more sea. Everything in the sea dies. The earth turns into a nice, round, smooth cue ball. But what's this? What can cause the heaven to depart as a scroll? Now, is that talking about 
some people have thought, oh, well, that's clouds coming. Now, if you look at this next uh, picture here, this is what one artist's rendition believes, that this is clouds that makes the, the heavens depart like a scroll. I have another theory. I can understand clouds coming up. But something, just clouds coming up, can't make the stars withdraw their shining. Clouds can't turn the earth upside down. Clouds can't cause volcanoes to wake up. Earthquakes can't cause every mountain to fall, every valley to raise. What, oh, that's Jesus, Dan. Well, yeah, there's no question Jesus is coming. But I have another theory. What if that planet, as it gets closer, is, let's say, approaching the size of the sun, but it's a black planet? And let's say it has more iron in the core and it's so it's like a giant magnet. And as it nears the earth, not that it'll hit the earth, but as it nears the earth, it begins to bend the light. You see, because we, we know that that light can be bent with magnetism. What if it's so strong that it begins to bend the light of the stars? The stars are still there. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to interrupt right there, but I do encourage you to get this. As I said, I'm going to be making a new DVD called Revelations on Revelation. And in preparation for that DVD being released at some point in hopefully the next few months, it's important for you to understand the basics of Revelation because I'm not going to be covering that in that new DVD. This is going to be totally new information. I'm not going to be covering Revelation verse by verse. In preparation for the new DVD, I recommend you get this DVD, Revelation verse by verse, if you don't already have it. 612 slides, 212 pictures, 10 charts. You will thoroughly understand Revelation in preparation for the next one on Revelation. On Revelation, it's uh, four DVDs, eight hours, Valued at $120. In the past, we've offered it for a gift of $75. But today, you can get it for a gift of $30. 785-266-1112 or prophecyclub.com. Revelation verse by verse. 785-266-1112 or prophecyclub.com. It's going to be really, really good. I recommend you get it. Thanks for listening. Thank you for your prayers and thank you for your gifts of support. God bless. Now from the Prophecy Club, some exciting opportunities for you. Lindsay Williams has just come out with his newest DVD titled How Trump Changed Elite Plans. How Trump Changed Elite Plans, and he did. Topics. Be prepared to view the most shocking DVD I've ever made. Nothing like this has happened in 6,000 years. Something catastrophic is beginning to develop. It will change your life forever and the life of your children and grandchildren. This is the most important information I've ever given about the future. Call How Trump Changed Elite Plans at prophecyclub.com. Available for shipping now. Brian Melvin did an excellent job making this DVD called Hell in a Box and From Hell to Heaven. Excellent talk. I've heard about 30 some odd talks of people that have passed on some to heaven, some to hell. This is one of the best ones. This held my attention all the way through. Now look. Just as archaeology can be really powerful to win people to Christ, and you need that. You need this DVD in your hands to show people this will convince people. I'm saying this will convince the skeptic to get saved very powerfully. You want this DVD in this book, Hell in a Box and Hell to Heaven, and the book, A Land Unknown, Hell's Dominion. DVD gift of 30 Book gift of 20, both for gift of 45, prophecyclub.com or 785-266-1112. The Hell Gift Offer. Keep them out of it with the Hell Gift Offer. Prophecyclub.com, 785-266-1112.